Hello, and welcome to this edition of the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and today we're going to talk about the extremely big and important question of pay in the public sector. That's pay for the teachers and nurses, civil servants, police, armed forces, and so on. Today I'm joined by Delphine Strauss, who's economics correspondent at the Financial Times and has been writing a lot about this recently and by Ben Zaranko, senior economist at the IFS, who's been doing a lot of work on public pay and public finances. Now, this is going to be one of the biggest issues, I think, facing this government, if we think of this as a new government. We spend well over £200 billion a year on public sector pay, and the decisions over that therefore matter enormously uh, from a fiscal point of view. Clearly, we have very high inflation and a cost of living crisis, and the public sector on the whole are not being offered pay settlements anywhere near the level of inflation. We've all seen talk about strikes across various elements of the public sector, and we know that the public finances themselves are in a bit of trouble over the next few years. So a very big issue indeed. So, um, Ben, perhaps you could start just by putting the scale of that issue into a little bit of context. I've just said that we spend about $200 billion a year on public sector pay. That's quite a lot, isn't it? And a lot of what happens to the quality of public services over the next few years may depend on what happens to public sector pay settlements. Absolutely. $200 billion, It's more than 200 billion. It's more £230 billion pounds is, a, is a big number in the public finances. It's more, around a fifth of all government spending and more than a third of what we spend on public services. It makes up a big chunk of what the NHS, the education system, and so on spend. Relatively small sounding changes to what happens to pay for those five and a half million or so workers can have big effects because a 1% change on a very big number equals a big number. And for public services trying to plan their budgets going into a difficult winter and in the years ahead, what happens to the pay of the staff that they employ will be a big factor determining their the health of their finances, the services they're able to provide, and their ability to deliver on public service objectives like clearing the backlog in the NHS or the court system or improving our schools, or perhaps the focus under the new government making their contribution to a growth-friendly United Kingdom. All of which is terribly important. Um, Broadly speaking, and we'll get into the details a little bit more, uh, government's offering public sector workers 5% 5% or so across the board um, against inflation of 10% um, or so. Now, that's quite a big pay cut. Um, Delphine, you've been talking to um, the unions. Um, you've got a sense of what the response to that might be. I mean, how fed up are people in the public sector about um, about getting offered, broadly speaking, 5% when inflation's at 10 They're incredibly fed up. And it's not just because of this one year's settlement where we have exceptional inflation. For them, I think the final straw in a very long running series of disappointments where over the last 10, 15 years or so, public sector workers have been trailing private sector counterparts. And I think people are especially angry because it comes after these two, two years of COVID where we had all of the rhetoric on key workers and recognising their contribution and and so on. And people feel that it really didn't amount to much. It's coming at a time where it's a really difficult context for industrial relations in general. Employers can't afford to pay more, but they've also got huge recruitment pressures. Public sector workers don't normally jump ship that quickly, but at the moment, a lot of them have better job options going. And um, if public sector and employers don't have the flexibility that private sector employers have, then they're going to be having you know, much worse recruitment difficulties. That gets to the absolute nub of the problem, doesn't it? A combination of things that you said there. First is that this is the another straw, which is breaking the camel's back, but also the issues around recruitment and retention. Let, let's get to the issue of the of the straw on the t- camel's back here. Ben, you've been looking at what's been happening to public sector pay over time. And I think part of the issue here is that this is a real pay cut on top of real pay cuts over the last decade. That's right. If we cast our minds back to the heady days of 2010, George Osborne and uh, David Cameron come into government and they froze the pay for most public sector workers for several years. Pay increases were then capped at around 1%. 
And then only just as the pay cap was undone and pay started to rise a little bit faster than inflation, you then had the COVID pandemic. Lots of workers had their pay frozen again. And all, what that adds up to is average real terms pay in the public sector being around 5% lower than it was in 2010 for some particular roles in the public sector. Current public sector workers are paid considerably less, sometimes 10, 15% less than their counterparts were around a decade or so ago. In general, it's the more highly paid, more experienced public sector workers who've experienced the biggest pay cuts. And what that adds up to is quite a fed up workforce. As Delphine was saying, maybe the straw on the camel's back. And it means that relative to pay in the private sector, hourly pay in the public sector, once you adjust for workers' various characteristics and so on, is at its lowest point in at least 30 years. And this is an ongoing, steady thing that's been happening for the past decade. And it's added up to a lot of discontent, I think it's fair to say. And one of the issues, of course, is the private sector hasn't been doing terribly well over the last 10, 15 years. And indeed, uh, for private sector pay, it's been pretty much the worst decade since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and the public sector is doing even worse. I think that, that clearly brings real risks in terms of, as you were saying, recruitment, retention, strikes, and so on. It does. I mean, we're seeing those risks getting bigger on both fronts. When it comes to strikes, most of the big public sector unions are now planning to ballot their members over the autumn on industrial action. Some are running indicative ballots first, some are, some are now at the stage where they're already going out to members to ask whether they'll, whether they'll vote for industrial action or not. It'll be quite a big operation, and I don't think we'll know for a few months yet exactly what the appetite for confrontation is. And it's not clear cut which way it will go. But we are already at the same time seeing recruitment and retention pressures worsening. When you look at vacancy rates in the NHS, they're going up quite sharply. I think the overall vacancy rate across the NHS is now, now at a record high. And for, some, for, 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 for nursing staff and medical staff, it's not quite as bad as it's been in some previous years, but it's gone up very sharply recently. There are also very bad results coming out of staff surveys on morale. In teaching, I think you're also seeing some pressures starting to worsen, not necessarily in the, in the vacancy rate itself, but when you speak to head teachers, they will say privately that they have far fewer candidates coming forward than in the past, and they're maybe making choices they wouldn't have had to made in, make in the past. They're recruiting people who are less experienced or maybe not the candidate they would have gone for a few years ago. And I think that compromise on quality is going to be difficult at a time when we're all already worried enough about catching up from, you know, COVID learning loss and so on. So I think, you know, whether or not the strikes happen, we've already got big problems. What, what do we know about the efficacy of public sector strikes? I mean, teachers have had periods of action um, over the last um, several years. I mean, is, is, is your impression that... Uh, governments take notice of this or that this is the sort of thing that if it's teachers or, or nurses or whatever striking, it's really the public who get fed up and it doesn't really help their case. They are among the most unionised parts of the entire economy, but is that a unionisation that they're actually able to really bring to bear effectively in defending their pay? So I think that's what we're about to find out. I mean, the calculation by the government, both towards the end of Boris Johnson's government and, 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 you know, going by what Liz Truss has said during the leadership contest, is that they're not necessarily worried about having a confrontation. They think that, um, you know, workers who strike don't get public sympathy for long and that we'll, it, it'll play in their favour. I'm not sure if that's true. I think there's been quite a swing in sentiment, as we saw when rail workers went on strike earlier in the summer. There was far less discontent among commuters than you'd normally expect. The unions themselves are saying that their polling suggests they've got public sympathy on their side. But we haven't had this big a test of it for a long time. We've had, I think, the last big set of strikes was in 2011 when we had um, strikes over public sector pensions. If this turns into, you know, large sections of the NHS and the teaching workforce and doctors going on strike more or less simultaneously, it'll be a very different affair. So, Ben, that, I mean, there are clearly um, pressures for higher spending here. We're already seeing pay rises of around 5% for most public sector workers, though not, it has to be said, for civil servants who are doing very badly yet again. 
Two percent for junior civil servants this year. Two percent, um, and for senior civil servants. Uh, I think similar thing. They offered them the same. Two percent. So two percent for. Two to three percent. Yes, I think for senior civil servants, with a little bit of a skew towards the bottom end of pay scales. And it's worth saying that civil servants themselves have done even worse than the public sector as a whole over the last decade. Now, they often don't get a great deal of sympathy, but they are the people who work in job centres and um, uh, HMRC um, tax offices and so on, as well as, uh, as well as in Whitehall. Indeed, the large majority of them are of that nature rather than the, the Mandarin sitting in their office with the minister in Whitehall make up only a very tiny fraction of the, uh, of the civil service. But we're looking at increases of 2% there. 5% for much of the rest of the public sector. But one of the problems, Ben, is that um, the amount of money that government departments actually have to spend, um, and therefore the amount that schools and hospitals and so on have to spend, was set a year ago when we thought inflation would only be 2.5%, 3%, something like that. And they're having to adapt to inflation at a much higher level with a fixed budget. That is absolutely the problem. You've got, on the one hand, uh, public sector workers and their families looking at a pay rise of 4 to 5% for most of them, which is just not going to keep pace with rising prices and means a real terms pay cut and probably a real terms hit to their living standards. Then you've got on the other side, the government are also unhappy, or at least the public service providers are, because they're being asked to make these pay awards of around 5% using budgets that were predicated on pay awards of more like 2 or 3%. And that money's got to come from somewhere. Now, you maybe you can make some savings by... Uh, you know, a recruitment pause, maybe you make cuts for the budgets, you cut back on non-essentials. I think there's stories about schools no longer hiring teaching assistants, for example, or cutting back on how much they spend on textbooks. These are all sort of inevitable consequences if you say you have to spend the same amount or more on pay and you have to do it from within the same budget. Something has to give. And I think what may give in some cases is the quality of public services. We may see deterioration, a further deterioration at the in what these public services are able to achieve and offer to the population and that is you know in, to some extent a gamble the government's taking or a choice that it's making at least in the circumstances and that's when giving only five percent if we were to give ten percent then the impact would be you know, much higher still uh, yes maybe you can make up a two percent gap in the short term although it must be said you're having to do that whilst paying more for energy more for food more for fuel and so on but if you're looking at a ten percent rise or a sustained rise above what was planned. It just does not, it, something has to give, and I think what has to give ultimately is the government will have to come forward with more money. It simply is not feasible to offer a 10 or a 12 or 15% pay award without extra cash to pay for that. The numbers just simply do not add up. So I, I would bet on uh, another spending review, and despite um, the new prime minister's commitment to a smaller state, uh, more money coming forth because it's simply not, feasible or is it to carry on with the current level of promised spending well people who regularly listen to this podcast paul may remember you betting me five pounds a few weeks ago that that, that would indeed <laughs> happen and i'm happy to stick to that bet um i think that some money yeah is, is likely to come to have to uh, be announced if they are going to announce again a pay award of in the region of let's say inflation next year is still running at eight nine ten percent a two percent pay award isn't going to fly you're going to be looking at a higher pay award and that you're going to have to eventually have extra funding. I think that's right, but the scale of that and what the government's willing to countenance at the same time as wanting to make big tax cuts and wanting to do all sorts of other things remains to be seen. And of course, the economic outlook is changing extremely rapidly at the moment. We just don't know where we're going to be in a, in a year's time. And so I'd be hesitant to put more than five pounds behind that. <laughs> And Delphine, you've, uh, I think, been looking at, to some extent, the consequences of all of this for the actual public sector workers in terms of their cost of living and uh, the, the impact that it's having and how that compares to others. I mean, to, to what extent are we seeing actual evidence of people really beginning to struggle? We've been hearing some interesting stories, um, in particular from a call out we did to readers asking them, you know, how they, how they were feeling the cost of living pressures and what changes they were making. You know, to be honest, we were expecting to hear back from some fairly comfortable FT readers who were, you know, maybe buying fewer branded goods at the supermarket. Um, but what actually came across really strongly was that, you know, of course, we have some of those readers. But we also had a lot of responses from public sector workers who were having to put quite big life decisions on hold. And I mean, we'll be writing more about 
all of this food. But, um, you know, we were hearing from NHS workers who maybe had been planning to move to the southeast of the country. They put that on hold. One lady who had a 70-mile 70, 70 round, round trip commute with a petrol cost that had gone sky high. And she was having to sort of nudge her teenage kids to get jobs just so they could cover a few more of their own costs. Mm-hmm. Somebody else who put a wedding on hold. Um, you know, just a, just a lot of personal stories of the difference it made when you have that really under par pay settlement or, um, where, you know, we're still waiting for the backdated pay settlement to come through. I think we're also hearing a lot from the people who are trying to manage the budget juggling. Ben was talking about the trade-offs that public sector managers have to make if they're trying to make these pay rises from a budget that hasn't grown. That's particularly acute in teaching because, of course, the decisions get handed straight down to the head teachers and the deputy heads. They're not done centrally. And so we've been talking to lots of school leaders who are already saying they have to make incredibly difficult choices because their wage bill is going up and they can't hire teaching assistants or they've got an energy bill that's gone up at the same time or they can't pay for school trips or whatever it is. Um, and so that's sort of that, that's biting really quickly. Uh, those are very striking stories. One of the things that is, across some parts of the public sector at least, one of the responses to that has been to be a bit more generous to lower paid workers than to higher paid workers. For example, brand new teachers are getting much bigger pay rises than more experienced um, teachers. Senior civil servants have um, had their real pay cut a lot over over recent years. Ben, is that is is, is that a reasonable response to this? It's uh, to, to to focus what money there is on the least well paid. I think it's certainly an understandable one. I think that um, as heart-wrenching as some of the stories are um, and how difficult some of those, those choices about delaying a wedding, for example, are, I think that there is perhaps greater concern for those at the very bottom of the pay distribution for whom the choices might be you know, heating or eating. And I think that there's a desire to, help, to protect the lowest paid. I think that's understandable. I'm just not convinced that public sector pay is the right tool to be using if we want to help those individuals and their families. There are lots of low paid people in the private sector as well. If anything, the lower paid people in the public sector do especially well compared to the private sector. Their higher paid counterparts actually, while there's a pay premium for those at the bottom end, roughly speaking, is the opposite of a pay premium, a pay penalty for those at the top end of the wage distribution. And so what we've had since 2010 is a repeated policy of prioritizing the lowest paid um, offering a pay freeze to everybody but the lowest paid who got £250, for example, and then more recently, uh, pay pause. It was it was billed as with exceptions for the lowest paid. And what you've had is a, basically a compression of the public sector pay distribution where you've seen the lowest paid c- closing the gap with their higher paid counterparts. Now, that's not it's a completely legitimate policy choice to have made. What it does mean is that for many people, the financial rewards from climbing up the ladder may be smaller than they once were. Maybe the additional stress you get from taking on that management role no longer feels worth it, given the fairly meager increase in your pay packet at the end of every month. And there has to be a risk that if you continually only give pay awards or continually give the biggest pay awards to those at the bottom end, you you maybe impede your ability to keep hold of your more experienced workers, or maybe you blunt some of the incentives for people to take on extra roles and become more senior and go on extra training courses or whatever it is. And it just potentially stores up some problems for the future. And I think it's something you couldn't do indefinitely. But as I say, in the current circumstances, it, it is a decision that is perfectly understandable. But it's one of the it's one of the curiosities, isn't it? We often worry about inequality in pay for very good reasons. But the uh, public sector has much lower levels of inequality than uh, than the private sector. In other words, I think you're saying that high-paid public sector workers earn less than they would do if they went into the private sector, and lower-paid workers earn more than they would do if they went into the private sector. Um, is that um, is that consistent with the sort of stories that you're hearing, Delphine? I mean, you were talking about people moving into the private sector in some of the conversations you've had and problems recruiting in the in the health service. Is this a problem right across the distribution or more towards the, 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 the lower end of earnings? So as Ben says, we've seen this policy repeated in a number of pay rounds that the government has for 
various reasons chosen to focus the um, what, what money there was available on people at the in the lower pay bands and give them slightly more generous rises. There are obviously good reasons to do that at the moment, both on ethical grounds, if those are the people with the you know with the, with the heating or eating choice, and it's also in line with a lot of the evidence that's gone to the pay review bodies, saying that actually that's also where you might need to focus the resources if you're going to address the worst of the recruitment problems. I think for teaching especially, you know, the problems have been in actually getting high enough applications into initial teacher training and with early career teachers leaving, you know, too quickly after they've trained. And what one finds is that at senior level, teachers are, you know, do feel very badly underpaid, but they've invested a lot of years in their career already. They don't necessarily have a great option to jump off to. So you don't necessarily see people leaving. What you do see is people who've reached senior level and don't think it's worth going for the extra promotion, maybe don't think it's worth moving from being a deputy to a head teacher. They sort of see the career risks and the workload issues and they don't want to make those final steps. And so I think as Ben says, this is this is a this is this is a sort of a policy decision that can make sense in any individual year, but the longer you do it for, the more the pressures build up. I think that's a really good way of thinking about it. And just to add another example of what you were talking about there, Delphine, is the NHS peer review body this year were very clear that actually it's their lowest paid people. So think about maybe your your porters or your non-clinically qualified staff where there are opportunities of working in retail or in warehousing or other sorts of professions where they're just, the pay is better, the hours are better and the stress is lower and they're struggling to keep hold of lots of those people. And I think in those circumstances, you can absolutely can and should justify focusing pay awards where recruitment difficulties are most acute. I think it's just that doing so continually every year, you perhaps end up with a pay distribution and you look at it so at the boiling frog and you look at it and say, oh, well, how do we end up here and why are we struggling to keep hold of our, our best top end staff? Um, but it is understandable in any given year to, to go down this road. But it's interesting. I mean, you, you almost said, Delphine, that there are some groups in the public sector, perhaps experienced teachers, who don't have much choice because they've been doing it for a long time and might struggle to get an equal job in the outside world, um, who the government can effectively exploit because um, they can, up to a point at least, they can keep cutting pay and be fairly confident that they'll stay. Whereas if you're thinking of becoming a teacher or you're a newly qualified teacher, you've got a lot more options and therefore it's a lot harder to, to keep the wages down. I mean, this is what the unions, what, what, what the head teachers union would say, and it's what it's probably true of any profession that when you've invested 10, 15 years, you know, working your way up in terms of experience and position, you know, you have more to lose by leaving that profession and making an entire new career start. It will take you several years to regain your level of earnings, even if even if you weren't very happy with your pay. Um, and so it could well be that people who are either in less skilled roles or who are early in their careers are more of a flight risk in the immediate term. But if you continually underpay more experienced people, you will end up with big problems with motivation and incentives to progress. And of course, junior people, many of them hope to become senior people at some point and the, um, uh, and the impact on their decisions shouldn't be neglected either. They may stay a little bit longer if the initial pay is, is better, but um, if they can see that the future pay is less good, then this isn't a, a policy that's time consistent or sustainable over long periods. We, we, we ought to talk, since we're talking about public sector pay, we have to talk about pensions, don't we? Because it's all very well to say that uh, public sector pay is being falling behind the private sector and we're worried about public sector workers and so on. But on average, they have much more generous pensions than people in the private sector. I mean, does that sort of undo really all of this concern? These pensions are, I mean, they really are a lot more generous, aren't they? Once you take account of that, the total remuneration package in the public sector looks a lot more generous relative to the private sector. And maybe it's fine to cut pay because um, we know that lots of private sector generous pensions have been closed over recent years, um, being reduced a bit in the public sector, but they're still much more than they are elsewhere. Are we worrying unnecessarily given the scale of that? One number to put some of that in context. In the public sector, almost half 
47% of people get a pension contribution from their employer worth 20% or more of their pay. In the private sector, that's 2%. That's just an enormous gulf. And you know, the average pension contribution you get from an employer in the public sector is just much more than what um, most people in the private sector are receiving. And if you take that into account and you look at the gap in total remuneration between the two sectors, there is still uh, a positive public-private differential. So on average, remuneration in the public sector is higher than for similar people in the private sector. The problem is that the way that that is structured. And I think one big question, which I don't think we adequately know the answer to, is to what extent uh, take-home pay is really the important thing, particularly in a moment like this where people's living standards are being squeezed. You can't heat your home with a pension promise for 35 years into the future. It might be nice to have, but if you're more focused on the immediate term, then what actually you get taking home in your pay packet each month, which may well be higher in the private sector, even if the overall remuneration is lower, might become more important. And so I think that we absolutely need to remember that, yes, pensions are much more generous in the public sector. And that does mean that there probably is overall a positive remuneration premium. It does not take away from these difficulties about retention, about recruitment, about motivation. And I think that that's only heightened at this present moment in time when take-home pay is probably especially prescient. So, Delphine, is there a deal to be done here? I mean, what, what, what about a deal whereby nurses, teachers, what have you, agree to uh, a lower pension in the future in return for higher pay now? That sounds like a tough deal to sell to me. That's <laughs> <laughs> all I'd say. Um, I think the argument's going to be over pay now. And if you try, if you try and call pensions into question at this point... It's not going to go well. I mean, presumably, it's uh, part, part of the reason it's a hard deal is that, um, that there's a pension promise there. And of course, you may increase pay now, but you can always cut it again in the future. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, I'd second everything Ben said is that, that, that there clearly is an understanding at the moment that one of the main reasons you work in the public sector, despite all of the workload issues and the, and the meagre pay increases, is, is because, you know, everybody knows perfectly well the pensions are extremely good relative to the private sector. But that doesn't alter the fact that the overall package has been worsening over the last few years and that it might not be top of your mind right now. And it, it's, it's, it's an odd deal, isn't it? But I mean, wh- wh- why have we ended up in this weird position where we've got these pensions are so much more generous in the public sector than the private sector, um, but, but the relative pay is appears to be going down and down and down? Relative pay is certainly going down and down. I don't have the, uh, I'm not able to provide a full history of how we end up exactly where we are. I think one part of it has to be just just that pension rights are harder to, for a government to erode than our our headline pay. I think I could see why if I were a trade union negotiator, I'd be reluctant to sign away um, employer pension rights and promises that are, you know, written down in law and contractually solid in return for pay awards that the government might make now, but then roll back on. There's a sort of a commitment problem. The government can't credibly commit to keep to keep to its pay awards in future, particularly given, you know, changes of of government and minister and so on. But there's there's another perhaps option where even just ignoring what the employer pays, individuals in the public sector often face very high employee contributions, especially those who are at the higher end of the pay distribution of doctors and so on often face very high employee contributions. And you can imagine a world where it's all their money. They might just prefer to have a bit more of it today and a bit less of it in future. So maybe you could lessen the employee contributions a bit, knock off whatever the actuaries say, you have to knock off pensions to make the numbers add up. And the doctor's left with more pay each month in their pay packet, a slightly lower pension in future, no change in the overall cost to the public sector provider, in this case, the NHS, and maybe everybody's happier. It feels like it, well, most people perhaps are happier. It feels possible, at least in theory, that you could, similarly with civil servants, make some sort of deal like that without touching the employer element. But I imagine it's much easier for me to pontificate than it is to actually put it into practice in the negotiating room. I mean, it's worth putting uh, some of this in a little bit of perspective. I think it's right to say, isn't it, um, that... If you're a lifetime low earner in the NHS, maybe you've been working as a porter there for a long period of time, you will literally have more money in pension when you retire, and once you're taking out the state pension and the NHS pension, than you earned each year during your life. For some people, 
that will be true because of the way that uh, past services operated when not the all parameters of these pension schemes were fixed. I don't think people are expecting such abysmal pay growth and productivity growth. And so getting, say, CPI or CPI plus three or CPI plus something operating on your past service, that's much more than your pay will have been going up by. So yeah, your, your pension rights will be accruing faster than your pay has been. And you can end up maybe in your late 50s, early 60s in a world where, yeah, you'd be better off if you quit work, which clearly isn't good for keeping hold of your experienced workers who we need to hang on to help clear the backlog or whatever. So yes, I think that there are some quirks of how these schemes work that give some people peculiar incentives. Um, doctors' pensions are clearly one that's high in the news at the moment and of interest, it seems, to the new government in potentially fixing. Maybe we'll see an announcement on that this week. Uh, but yes, there are lots of quirks of these schemes that could be ironed out. But difficult to iron out for all sorts of um, all sorts of reasons. Um, but uh, yes, I, I'm a uh, slightly different issue. But I'm quite sh shocked by the number of my near contemporaries in the civil service who are retiring on nice big pensions at the moment, which is um, not an option open to us uh, to those of us who don't have those sorts of pensions. Delphine, what's going to happen next? I mean, this is um, uh, this is clearly. You know, this whole issue of pay in the public sector, I mean, I introduced this by saying I think it is one of the biggest questions, one of the biggest decisions facing this government because uh, they could go down the route of no extra money um, for public services, no more money than they're saying now for public pay. They might end up with strikes. We're going to get more vacancies in the NHS. Um, you know, real problems there. Or they could decide to make more money available and you, if not break this trust's promises, certainly go against her general um, uh, ambition to reduce the size of the state. I mean, how, how, how are we going to, where, where are we going to go from here? As you say, it could go, it could go in two very different directions. Um, and, you know, what we heard during the leadership contest was very confrontational. It was very, it was, it was very much, um, you know, Liz Truss promising a new wave of legislation to make it harder to strike, to to raise the ballot thresholds, to require sort of, you know, a minimum service in the public sector during during uh, strike periods. All kinds of measures that, that would make it harder to take action, and no sign whatsoever of um, movement on the overall amount of funding available for public services. I imagine a lot will depend on the economic context and whether it leaves workers feeling brave enough to take action or not. At the moment, we've been in a very tight labour market for the best part of a year. A lot of people are feeling that they don't have as much to lose as in the past if they do strike, because there are jobs out there. And a lot of them are offering decent pay, decent pay relative to, you know, relative to previous. But we've seen in the last couple of months of labour market data that things might be on the turn. The vacancies, um, the, the number of vacancies out there are coming down. People are starting to be more cautious about hiring. Employers are starting to be a lot more cautious about um, pay offers. And if in six months' time we have unemployment rising, perhaps inflation coming down, then I guess we could be in a very different context. That's really interesting. I mean, that's that's kind of saying that if the unions want to be taking action, they need to get a move on um, if they're going to take their members with them. But equally, if you're sitting in government, you might think, if I can weather the next six months, um, then maybe I can get through to the next election and reassess then. I think from the union's point of view, there's there's a window of opportunity right now that they're trying to take. Well, I think our window of opportunity for this edition of IFS Zooms In is coming to um, an end. Um, so thank you so much uh, to Delphine and to Ben, and thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, um, we have also recorded an episode on public sector pensions, which are, if anything, even more exciting than public sector pay. Um, earlier, um, just a month or two ago, with Lord Hutton of Furness, one of the architects of the current public sector pension system. So do tune into that uh, if you'd like to learn more about public service pensions. To see more of our work, visit www.ifs.org.uk. And if you want to support our work, please do consider becoming a supporter of the IFS for as little as £5 a month. You can find more information in the episode description. See you next time.